Welcome to this episode of the Catechetical Corner, Handing on and Defending the Faith. In paragraph 2297 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it states that except when performed for strictly therapeutic medical reasons, directly intended amputations, mutilations, and sterilizations performed on innocent persons are against the natural law. Modern culture has turned natural law and proper philosophy and human anthropology that concerns the person completely upside down. The idea of gender is no longer consistent with the biological reality of chromosomes that directly indicate the masculinity or femininity of a person. But rather, gender is prescribed as a social construct that allows for legal arguments for men using facilities designated solely for women and vice versa. In this episode, Trent Horn, Catholic Answers Apologist, provides logical and compassionate points of view to respond to the growing normalization of the LGBTQ community and the transgender narrative. Because we've actually, these, these all kind of segue and have built upon one another, so this is helpful. We're talking about morality, uh, understanding moral truths. Uh, I was asked to talk about LGBTQ issues. And this really uh, goes from the previous um, question is actually a good tee off for this. Uh, why are so many young people in favor of LGBTQ ideology? They're in favor of that and they're against abortion. I think a lot of times it's emotions. Like when they think of abortion, many young people are pro-life and it's been that way for a while. Uh, it's not like the LGBTQ stuff. Uh, I think it's because when they're pro-life, it's just easy for them to see the bad guy here. Like, look, here's abortion. Here is an, uh, a dismembered child. That's terrible. And it's easy for young people to see the evil involved and uh, not be deceived by any good that might be tried to be put in its place. Like a woman getting to go to college or ascend the corporate career ladder is not a good that could outweigh the visceral evil of abortion. So their emotions are actually pretty in, in tune there for many of them. With LGBTQ, it's very different. The evil of sodomy, of uh, disordered sexual behavior, does not seem as visceral to them. It is not counterbalanced by the, um, I'm sorry, it is counterbalanced by the good they see in affection and fidelity and mutual goods shared between uh, people in the LGBT relationships or identities. They see these people and say, well, these people seem really nice. Uh, how could this be wrong? These people are so nice. And that is why we do a great disservice to young people when we teach them morality and we get them to think that, and I, I mean, this happens. I mean, I watch comic book cartoons of my boys all the time. And so it's here's good and here's evil. Uh, actually, I watch the more mature ones where the evildoer is like the old Superman animated suit, not the old, old, the 90s Superman animated series, where Lex Luthor is actually a charming, charismatic guy. Uh, but we, we do a disservice to them when they think, okay, so the people who are engaged in grave sin are, are mean, bad, irredeemable people. And the people who follow God's law are good, charming, wonderful people. Then you get out in the real world and you meet Catholics that are obeying the teachings of the church, but they are just sometimes the most insufferable people. Oh, drives you up the wall sometimes. And then you meet people who are engaged in grave sins, who can actually be very pleasant and enjoyable. And you get this weird culture shock if you've never thought of it before like that. And you start to rearrange your whole worldview and think, well, I'd rather follow what the nice people are doing. Instead of saying, no, our temperament or disposition doesn't tell you if someone is doing something that's right or wrong. The moral law does. Reason tells us that. Uh, so how do we address these issues. I believe we have to address them with sound thinking and philosophy. It's important to share what God's word teaches. Absolutely. It's just unfortunate many people don't hold the, the church or the Bible and the authority and esteem that it once had. So sometimes we have to have an alternative approach. Once I was at the, a university in the Midwest, this is North Dakota, 
and this was many years ago before the Supreme Court legally redefined marriage. I was a talk on so-called same-sex marriage. So I get up, I give my talk. There must have been 200 people there. There was a whole row of atheists in the front wearing matching t-shirts waiting to, to pounce. And the talk was actually uneventful, just two things. One, there were two ladies who stood up and made out with each other to try to throw me off my game. I was like, all right, that's what you want to do. Uh, and the other was an administrator for this public university who told the students, if any of them felt triggered by what I said, they had a safe room for a safe room, like a panic room for them to go to. And I, I asked her, I said, do you do this for all the talks or just mine? And she, she wouldn't answer the question. So I gave my talk and the talk was on same-sex marriage, uh, so-called same-sex marriage and why marriage should not be redefined. And I'll explain to you the essence of that talk here shortly. But I remember afterwards when I was done with the talk, I said, are there any questions? There were no questions, not a single one from the audience. They thanked me and that was that. And I thought the atheists were gonna rip into me. So I saw them later and I said, hey guys, why no questions? And they said, honestly, we didn't know what to ask because you never mentioned the Bible, not once. And we were ready for you to mention the Bible and you didn't do that. So we didn't really know how to answer your arguments. And I said, well, they're, they're good arguments. You should, you should look into them. So what are the arguments? Let me talk first about so-called same-sex marriage and then I'll talk about the LGBTQ stuff. Uh, to, well, I'll run you through the acronym so you understand it. Uh, when it comes to marriage, my friend, Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris was in a debate once and she said, I'm not gonna focus on the same sex part in this debate. I'm gonna focus on the marriage part. We have to answer the question, what is marriage? Uh, that's why I don't even like the term same sex marriage. You'll notice that I've used the expression so-called same sex marriage. If marriage is just the celebration of the union of adults, if it's just a society's affirmation of an adult relationship, then same sex marriage makes perfect sense for the state and lots of other marriages make sense as well. It makes perfect sense. But if marriage just is that which unites men and women to each other in a lifelong monogamous bond, and it unites them to each other and to any children that may proceed from their union, then you can't have same-sex marriage any more than you could have a married bachelor or a round circle. If marriage is just the thing that brings men and women together in society, then you can't put same-sex in front of it. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not that same-sex marriage is wrong, it would be that same-sex marriage is impossible. It's like a square circle. And so how could we affirm that? Well, we have to distinguish between two different views of marriage, two different views. One would be the relational view that it's just about affirming adult relationships. And the other would be the conjugal view that marriage is about uniting men and women to each other and to any children that may proceed from their union. And so what I say is, look, uh, when we are talking about marriage, I would ask people, what view of marriage best explains marriage's essential elements? I would ask the other person, what is marriage? Explain that to me. What is it? And I believe that there are four essential elements to marriage. First, what makes marriage marriage and not like any other relationship on earth, there are four elements. Number one, it's recognized by the government or society. It's not a private relationship. It's a public relationship. I have friends, but I don't have to register my friends to anybody. We're friends, it's private, it doesn't have to be public. Marriage is public. Private marriages make no sense. It makes no sense to have a marriage, but you keep it a secret and you don't tell anybody you're married. Uh, that, that's, that would not be the purpose of marriage at all if you were married, but then you just keep it a secret from, from everybody else. It's a public matter. The state has a role in knowing about it. Uh, number two, it's ideally lifelong. I know a lot of cynics will say, it's not lifelong, look at all the divorces. Yeah, and divorce is a tragedy. The catechism says divorce is a plague upon society, but it's ideally lifelong. I've, I've seen non-Catholic weddings and they have sometimes have really weird vows, but they still do till death do us part. They do till death do us part, not till lack of love do us part. It's an ideal when Kim Kardashian many years ago was married for 72 days, people made fun of her, but why? In fact, I think it's better for her to get out of a marriage of 72 days than after like five or 10 years, honestly. You're going to do that. Not that it's not sinful. Uh, it's still wrong. But if people make fun of that, but they allow divorce later on, you're being inconsistent. Well, no, it's ideally lifelong. But why? No other relationship on earth is, we don't forge other relationships like that with uh, uh, personal, professional uh, relationships that we voluntarily choose. 
they're not I ideally life lifelong or held to that standard. Number three, marriage involves two people. It's mono it, it, there is a monogamy to it, both in number and in behavior. So it'd be numerically monogamous and sexually monogamous. Uh, so you, I mean, think about it. <laughs> it's funny when we go, when you watch a wedding, whether it's Catholic or not, there's usually a vow of like, I promise to be true to you. And it's interesting that we don't, I mean, there, there's an element to that about a, the general, not to betray a person in general, but really the promises in marriage, it's funny, we don't just come right out and say it in the wedding vows, I promise to be true to you. It's a promise to not have sex with anybody else. That's the big thing about marriage is like, I promise to only have sexual relations with you and not anybody else. That is what marriage is basically for. That's why we've had marriage for thousands of years among human societies, because people see that it's good for the people who engage in sexual relations to be united to each other and not have the guys running around impregnating anything that moves, basically. Because that's where you get societal chaos, is keep that bonded element together. That's what makes society stable. Otherwise, you see in our society, it's terrible. Uh, in 1963, I think something like only 7% of children were born out of wedlock. Today, it's 40%. In some communities, it's 70% of children are, oh, I'm sorry, it's even higher than that. That's not just born out of wedlock. Um, that it's also 40% uh, live apart from their biological father. Uh, in some communities, as high as 70%. And that's not good for the family. It leads to crime, leads to drug use, leads to poverty. Uh, so marriage is monogamous. That it's two, why is marriage only two people? And there's a sexual element to it. It's, it's sexual and it's monogamous. You know, I said four, it's really five. I said five in my old talk. I'm gonna stick with five. It's monogamous. It's sexual and it's sexually exclusive. Two people and there's a sexual element to it. That's what's weird. A lot of people today will say, well, why can't people get married if they love each other? I'll say, well, marriage isn't about love because when people don't feel in love with each other, they're still married. That's still marriage, that's important. It's not like the marriage stops when you go through a bad spot and you say you don't love your spouse. It doesn't mean you're not married anymore. And more, more so, the vast majority of people we love, we are not married to. Like you can love, so in fact, your experience of love with people should almost exclusively be non-sexual. It should be. It should almost exclusively, your, the expression of the experience of loving other people almost exclusively should be non-sexual. Though for many of us who are married, one of the most important people in our lives, like my spouse, uh, we're married. We have a marital relationship. And sex is not incidental to that. So you see, we have these two views, the relational view of marriage and the conjugal view of marriage. And I would say the relational view does not explain, it does not explain uh, why uh, marriage, the government is involved because we, we don't register friends or it's ideally lifelong or that it's two people. You can have more than one friend. Why not have more than one spouse? or that it has a sexual element to it at all. Because if it's marriage, it was two people who love each other. What about two elderly sisters who just want to care for each other? Can they get married? And people will say, well, no, well, why not? And people will say, well, that, you know, or a father marrying his son, they'll say, that's gross. They'll say, why? Because that's incest. I said, I said marriage, I'm not talking. Why do you think marriage has something to do with sex? But people know that it does. So the relational view doesn't explain marriage. The conjugal view does that marriage is about uniting a man and a woman in a conjugal relationship ordered towards producing children. Well, what about infertile couples? We let them get married. Right, because it is the union of a man and a woman. It is a relationship open towards children. But even if children, even if you can't control whether you have children or not, you can control whether you engage in the marital act. So in their book, What is Marriage? Sharif Gurgis, Ryan George, or sorry, Robert George and Ryan Anderson give this example. What makes a baseball team a baseball team? If it's nine guys on a field catching pop flies, that's not a baseball team. It's fun, but it's not a baseball team. They have to be ordered towards winning games. So even if a, even if a baseball team fails to win a single game, they are still a baseball team. They're ordered towards that end, even if they're not able to achieve it. They're still ordered towards it. Uh, and I remember once reading an article from a, uh, a defender of same-sex marriage saying, this is a bad argument, saying, oh, so you're comparing infertile couples to a losing baseball team? Are you saying infertile couples are losers? No, I'm not saying they're losers. 
I'm saying infertile couples experience a loss. They experience a profound sense of loss to mourn that a same-sex couple does not experience. Think about it. Two men who are married or two women who are married, quote, unquote. Would it make sense for them to feel a profound sense of loss over not having children? Well, no, because no more than I feel a profound sense of loss over not being able to fly by flapping my wings and my arms. It'd be cool. I would enjoy that. Like I see birds do it, but I'm not ordered to that way. So it's a little disappointing, but I, I shouldn't feel like I have a loss. I'm a healthy human being. With same-sex couples, many times people say, well, people will say, it, aren't an infertile opposite-sex couple, a same-sex couple is just as infertile. No, that's not the case. And many times these same-sex couples, both members are fertile. They're just not engaged in the act that is fecund, that is life-giving. They're not engaged in the marital act itself. So that's why, and I know with LGBT, it gets crude sometimes, but the, those who... The, the correct term would be sodomy, not, not things like homosexual sex. Sex is something only a man and woman can engage in. It's, it, it, anything else, even if it results in genital stimulation, that's not, that's not sex. It's not the sexual act. Uh, so the conjugal view best explains marriage. Though I will say this. When I go out in public and I try to teach people about marriage, why I do not believe mar a man and a woman, uh, sorry, why I don't believe two men or two women can be married, uh, why I don't believe that's a possibility. When I speak about this in public, I set the bar really low, low for my goal. My goal is just to convince people I'm not a lunatic or a bigot. That's like the bare minimum because our culture is so entrenched, but I'll, I'll tell you why. Why are people so entrenched in this, this LGBTQ ideology? I will tell you it's two things. 50 years ago, 60 years ago that did it, no-fault divorce and contraception. No-fault divorce and contraception turned marriage into the relational view. No fault divorce and contraception turned marriage 60 years ago into what it is, is today for same-sex couples, a sterile bond where children are optional, bound together by love, not by covenantal self-giving. So the seeds have been sown for a long time and now we're reaping the bounty or reaping the harvest. If you'd like more on that though, I definitely recommend my book, Made This Way with my co-author, Layla Miller. She's a mother of eight, grandmother of several, wonderful woman. Uh, my book, Made This Way, covers this in more detail. When it comes to LGBTQ um, ideology, I'll, I'll run you through the acronym and then give you some just tips on explaining it. LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, either women attracted to women, men attracted to men, or people who say they're attracted to both. Uh, here, I would just ask people the question, look, what is sex for? Ask them, what is sex for? Uh, otherwise, uh, you could, you could justify almost any sexual behavior, including behaviors I'm not gonna mention in polite company with you all, uh, because if it's just two people consenting, who knows what it, what it, what it'll, what it, what it could be. Uh, I would I ask, and I've asked people who identify as LGBT, what is sex for? And they'll either say it's not for anything or it's for pleasure. And I'll say to them, okay, if that's the case, then um, is infidelity wrong? Uh, so it's interesting, like when I, when me and my wife got married, imagine if I had said to her, or let's say she said to me, uh, I cannot go out to eat with anyone except her for the rest of my life. And I'd say, well, honey, I love going out to eat with you, but I might want to go out with the guys one night and get barbecue. It's a little controlling if you say to me, like, I can only go out to eat with you for the rest of my life and nobody else. I want to go out with other people and, and grab a bite. That, that should be okay. Uh, but then imagine my wife said that, you know, I can only have sexual relations with her and nobody else as long as we both shall live. Well, duh, that, that's marriage. But here, if sex is just for pleasure, if it has no meaning, then to demand that someone be monogamous is as controlling and overbearing as demanding that they have no other friends. So sex can't just be for pleasure. It has to be for expressing a particular kind of love, not just a pleasurable love, not just an enjoyment of company, but it's expressing marital love, which is the full gift of self to form a true bodily union with another person ordered towards a new life that is a symbol of that love. The life may not always come, but it's ordered towards the creation of that life that is a symbol 
of that love. So that would be the LGB uh, Q is queer questioning. It's kind of a grab bag of other identities that are involved. T transgender. Um, when people bring this up, unfortunately in our culture, I think a lot of people are rejecting the transgender ideology because it just makes no sense to say a man can become a woman. Uh, just, you know, you, you can't change your sex any more than you could change your race or your species by fiat or declaration. An example I like to give when the transgender ideology comes up is um, when people say, uh, well, the example I give is this. Okay, so you're saying that a person's gender is who they think they are as a man or woman, and that trumps their, whatever their biological sex says. All right, let me give you an example. There are people who have body identity integrity disorder, B-I-I-D, body identity integrity disorder. And so they honestly think they're paralyzed and they belong in a wheelchair, but they can move their legs, but they feel like they're trapped in the wrong body. So uh, what they do is they go to doctors and they say, will you sever my spinal cord? And the doctors say, no, I'm not gonna do that. You're a healthy person. They say, no, I know I look healthy, but I'm supposed to be paralyzed. The doctors won't do that. How is that any different from someone, a man who says, I know I look like a man, but I'm a woman, so I want my genitalia removed. Uh, the doctors say, no, it's perfectly healthy. Why, why would I do that? Uh, so I would bring up that example. And then I would also ask a question that no defender of transgender ideology can answer. None of them can answer this question. What is a woman and how are women different than men? They can't answer it, it's impossible for them because they say a woman is just anyone who claims to be a woman. But the biological reality of what makes someone a woman actually explains that a whole lot better. Finally, I'll leave you with this note that covers uh, a lot of what we've, we've already discussed. Uh, when we engage in these issues with other people, we must remember what St. Paul said in Ephesians 4.15, to speak the truth in love. Many times, especially on these moral issues, people have emotional baggage. They have uh, experiences they bring with. So it's important to be gentle, to be gracious, I would recommend asking questions more than making statements. What do you believe about this? Why do you think that? And remember the conversation goes on in a, a journey. Uh, we're not fighting toe to toe with people. We wanna walk shoulder to shoulder with them and guide them to the truth and be compassionate uh, based on whatever personal experiences they may have had so that we can always re remember what St. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, always be ready to give a reason for the hope within, but do so with gentleness and with reverence. And so everything that we have covered today, I hope you will follow that motto to always be ready to give a reason for what we believe, but to do so with gentleness and with reverence. Uh, what way would you go about speaking to a middle school age kid who maybe has a friend who is suffering with uh, gender dysphoria? Like they don't really know, you know, they, they think they're having that issue and they make the excuse that well, I really like them and I can't tell them those things. How do, how do you go about addressing that? I would, I would say for seventh and eighth graders, um, we should love people, right? Yes, of course. Okay. How do we love other people? Well, we, being nice to them is one thing, but we always make sure we will the good for them. We provide them what is good for them, not necessarily what somebody wants, because let's say you had a friend who had an eating disorder and they don't want to eat. And they're, 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 they're like, oh, I, I'm overweight. I, I have to lose weight, even though they're dangerously underweight. If you love this person, you won't just give them what they want and you won't feed into that disorder. You're not going to say to them, you are overweight and I won't tell people you're starving yourself. You don't do that. You would say, I love and care about you. And that's why I need to tell you, you're not overweight. You are actually underweight. And I, I want to help you have a better sense of who you are. The second question I have, I think they probably get a lot, probably more from high school age folks, maybe, right. maybe in a CCD program that have a friend that is either saying they're in the LGBT community or they're struggling with same sex attraction would be right. that they keep continue to make the argument that they were born that way. What's the mm -hmm. best way from a Catholic worldview and a natural law perspective to refute right. that assertion? What I would say is, just because you've had a feeling to do something for a long time, it doesn't mean you should act on it. So I think that we can acknowledge that many people who have same-sex attraction, that it feels innate. When they say born this way, I think what they mean is ever since puberty or early in life, they have felt this attraction and they didn't consciously choose it. And I think that's 
fair to describe in a ver wide variety of circumstances. There's no need to rebut it because we can say, look, there we should compare it to other innate desires we have that we shouldn't act on. But we must, 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 must be careful. You can easily step on a landmine here. For example, if you say pedophiles feel that they were born this way, is that does that make what they do okay? The conversation is just going to go to heck if you do that, because they're going to think you're calling them a pedophile, even though you're not. Here's better examples. One that I like is anger. And what's interesting is that while sexual attraction isn't a born this way, I know people close to me who have been angry, little short-tempered people from the minute they were born. From the minute, it's funny, there are some people when they were born, they barely cried, they're easygoing, and they have always been that way. But there are some people, they just blow their stack at the slightest provocation. And it's true. And you could say they were born this way. Like some of you who have children, you might have had an easygoing child and one who just explodes in tantrums and has a short fuse. Well, imagine if somebody said, look, I was who, who yells in anger at other people and gets really angry. Imagine if they said, well, so what? I was born this way. I was this is how I've been since I was a baby. I didn't choose this. You might say, well, you didn't choose the feelings of anger but you can choose whether you act on them or not. That's the problem. Cardinal Seurat, Prince of the Church, in his book, The Day is Not Far Spent, states that he is convinced that Western civilization is going through a lethal crisis. It has reached the limits of self-destructive hatred. And as for the churchmen who deliberately entertain ambiguities about the Christian view of homosexual behavior by saying that, morally speaking, all forms of sexuality are equal, I tell them they are doing the work of the Prince of Lies and they lack charity toward the other person involved. This outward mutilation of their body is an external manifestation of their own inner rejection of the image of the triune God within them. In love, we must bring this false ideology and its harmful promises out of the darkness and into the light of Christ for all the world to see. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Catechetical Corner. And join us next time as Father Clinton Sensat, priest of the Diocese of Lafayette, begins a four-part series on the creed and sacred liturgy explained in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. God love you, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.